the area of northern Virginia just beyond the city of Alexandria was a genuine no man's land with rival cavalries and sympathizers skirmishing and sniping at one another. The Confederate government formally recognized irregular partisan rangers as an integral part of the Confederate armed forces. Now, the Union regarded such irregular fighters as little better than pirates, since they were permitted to keep anything that they could capture from federal troops. Commanders sometimes sent locomotives to reconnoiter the terrain and gain information on Confederate troop dispositions. A lone locomotive could quickly reverse direction and move as fast as 60 miles an hour far faster than pursuing cavalry. Locomotives were also useful as courier vehicles, an important advantage when Confederate raiders such as John Singleton Mosby and his men were cutting telegraph lines. Colonel Mosby's raiders were a constant danger to the railroads. In October, <clears throat> in October 1864, a number of Alexandria's prominent citizens, known to be Confederate sympathizers, were forced to ride military trains as hostages. Edgar Snowden, Jr., editor of the Alexandria Gazette, was one of the hostages, and the Gazette was forced to suspend publication for three months. We next have a photo of workers repairing telegraph lines. The Telegraph Service was a civilian bureau attached to the Army Quartermaster's Department. The men who performed the dangerous work in the field were mere employees and often were treated very badly and with very little consideration by the military. There were more than 300 casualties among these brave telegraph operators during the war. Let's take a look now at the importance of the river. Here we have a picture of the wharf at Alexandria. Since the earliest colonial times, Alexandria had always been a busy and bustling port. As relations between North and South deteriorated, the Northern press accused Virginians of stopping small ships headed for Washington. And in turn, the Alexandria Gazette accused federal authorities of seizing ships headed for Alexandria and of interfering with Virginia trade. Well, at the outbreak of the war, the Confederate government built gun batteries on the Potomac River to stop Union vessels from reaching Washington. This blockade ended in early 1862 as the Confederate Army retreated southward. But the Confederacy's new ironclad CSS Virginia, known to history as the Merrimack, soon provided fresh, if short-lived, worries as federal officials expected an attack up the Potomac River. We next have a picture of the steam frigate Pensacola. In March 1862, hundreds of vessels departed for the big push on Richmond, organized by General George B. McClellan. Private Robert Sneeden wrote, the fleet began to slowly sail and steam down the Potomac amid the cheers of the soldiers, booming of guns in salute, and the playing of several bands. The glistening muskets and bayonets of the white sails of the sailing vessels gave an impressive effect. We next have a picture of rail uh, sailors on a Russian frigate. One of the wartime highlights for Alexandria was the arrival of the Imperial Russian warships on a goodwill tour. The ships sailed up the Potomac in late October to call on President Lincoln and remained at anchor above Alexandria for several months. The visit of the Russian fleet was a morale boost for the embattled Union. Alexandria was also an important hospital center for the Union Army. Here we have a bird's eye view of Sickle Hospital. Joshua Engels of the 149th Pennsylvania Infantry was shot through the chest at North Anna River 
after spending the night on the battlefield, Engels was almost abandoned by a harried surgeon. The surgeon relented, and Engels found himself first in Washington and then in the hospitals of Alexandria. Four churches and many large houses were converted into hospitals, totaling 14 facilities in all. But facilities were often overcrowded and unsanitary, especially after a major battle. Here we have a picture of Episcopal Seminary, which had been turned into a hospital. It was really one of the best, but hospitals were mostly hastily improvised and inadequate. Antiseptics were unknown. The relationship of dirt to infection was generally not understood. And anesthesia was just coming into general use. Mortality from disease was far higher than from bullets. Hospitalization was often regarded as equivalent to a death sentence. An inspection of Union hospitals in 1863 reported one-third of them to be bad, or very bad. Buildings adapted for use as general hospitals were usually considered unsatisfactory because of inadequate plumbing and bad ventilation. And the staff, aside from medical officers and nurses, was mostly made up of convalescents. They were frequently weak and often irritable. Female nurses were very much liked by the patients and were not so much nurses as mother's substitutes. They wrote letters for their boys, read to them, decorated the wards with handsome garlands, and sometimes sang. We next have a picture of the U.S. Sanitary Commission. The Sanitary Commission was recognized by the War Department in June 1861. Its purpose was to promote clean and healthy conditions in the Union Army. The Sanitary Commission staffed field hospitals, raised money, provided supplies, and worked to educate the military and government on matters of health and sanitation. But of course, not all soldiers could be saved. And we next have a picture of the Soldiers' Cemetery, known today as the Alexandria National Cemetery. This cemetery is the final resting place for nearly 3,600 federal soldiers. Alexandria was also an important center for military prisons. The military operated five prisons in Alexandria. The Mount Vernon Cotton Factory housed some 1,500 Confederate POWs in overcrowded and unsanitary conditions. Prisoners housed at this Washington Street prison were generally en route to prison camps in the north, while spies and enemy sympathizers were housed at the Oddfellows Hall. The old Duke Street slave pen was used to house drunken and disorderly Union soldiers, of which there were plenty. And Union deserters were imprisoned in the Prince Street prison. Captain Rufus D. Pettit, who served as the superintendent of U.S. military prisons in Alexandria, was court-martialed for his brutal treatment of prisoners, found guilty and dishonorably discharged. Even during a time of the nation's most imminent peril, the Lincoln government knew what was and was not torture and mistreatment of prisoners. No discussion of military operations around Washington would be complete without a look at the ring of fortifications. There were 68 major forts connected by military roads and rifle trenches, ringing the federal capital. This was the Union's last line of defense against the Confederate Army. This formidable network of earthwork fortifications bristled with more than 900 cannons and 98 mortars. After the war, 
when asked why the Confederate Army did not attack Washington 